The cannabis industry has stirred much conversation. Today, all eyes are on cannabis companies that are setting investors' pockets ablaze as they grow from strength to strength. Today, we have three people at the forefront of this business and cultural moment. Please welcome to the stage Charles Bactel, co-founder and CEO of Cresco Labs from Tusk Holdings, Bradley Tusk, and Chief Advocacy Officer at Canopy Growth, Hillary Black. Yeah, you're in a standalone. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Anne Gaviola and I'm going to be moderating for you this afternoon. I like to get into uh, a, a, just a very quick intro so that you guys understand who's up here on the stage with me. So uh, we're going to go along and have you guys introduce yourself and your connection to the topic. I'll start with myself. Like I said, Anne Gaviola and I'm the Economics and Money Editor over at Vice Canada. I'm a longtime financial journalist. I write a lot of stories for millennials and Gen Z or Gen Z about housing and debt and cannabis. So that is my particular connection to this topic. And Charlie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, hello, uh, Charlie Bachtel, co-founder and CEO of Cresco Labs. Uh, Cresco Labs, one of the largest uh, multi-state operators in the US, uh, fully vertically integrated, everything from cultivation through processing, uh, product manufacturing, distribution and retail, and uh, currently has a footprint of 11 states. Hillary? Uh, hello, all you lovely people. Thank you for coming out to chat about cannabis. Uh, my name is Hilary Black. I started the first medical cannabis dispensary in Canada 23 years ago. Back then, the technology that I used was a pager. Um, and two decades later, we've moved a lot of mountains in Canada around regulations for patients and adults to access cannabis. And I'm currently the chief advocacy officer for Canopy Growth. Great. Uh, hi, I'm Bradley Tusk. I run a venture capital fund in New York that focuses on the intersection of tech and politics. So we'll invest in those startups that have big kind of political fights like cannabis or Uber or Bird or Lemonade or FanDuel and stuff like that. And then we run the campaign and try to disrupt everyone and make them really crazy. Okay, let's get into the meat of the discussion. I'm going to start out pretty broad and you guys take it where you want to go. What is new and exciting in the weed space for the industry this year. What are you seeing that you hadn't seen before? Anyone? Political support, I think, is a, uh, is a big thing that's going on in the US. Uh, cannabis, at this point in time, has become an electable position. Uh, you're seeing uh, folks at the state level and at the federal level either win or hold on to their seats by uh, changing their perspective from anti-cannabis to pro-cannabis. So, uh, good momentum at a political front. I think one of the biggest things that's changed in Canada this year since federal legalization is we're starting to lose some of the stigma and shame around using cannabis. We have a cultural shift happening, and so we're going to play a quick little game. I call it coming out green. How many of you are willing to admit you used cannabis the past year? Anybody use cannabis this year? Has anybody used cannabis in the past month? Has anybody used cannabis this week? Did anybody yeah, use did cannabis actually. yesterday? Did anybody yeah. use a little bit of cannabis on their way to this event today? <laughs> yeah, there's a few people in the room. So this conversation would have been very different six months ago, and thank you for just putting up your hands and being a part of changing the stigma. Yeah, that's, that's great. So, so I was told that we want controversy and conflict, so I am going to agree <laughs> and disagree with what Charles said. Um, and, and to your point also, Hillary, it has become much more politically acceptable that we can all raise our hands or you can even be forced to take a position to be pro-cannabis um, as a politician. So on one hand, that's great. On the other hand, I think I would argue this is a year where execution of all these opportunities to legalize recreational cannabis in the U.S. fell short in most places. Hopefully there's one or two like Illinois that will still happen. Um, and I think some really big opportunities have been missed. Um, and I worry a little bit that that sets back the entire movement. Okay, let's, let's talk as well about uh, the challenges. This is an emerging industry. Some people say it's still in its infancy. What are some of the biggest things that, as an industry, have to be overcome? Is it uh, an accounting problem? Is it governance? Is it transparency? What is it? 
I'd agree with almost everything that you yeah. said. I, I, I think you know all of those. Uh, cannabis, and as, as Bradley had mentioned, cannabis is sort of at this. Um, it's an inflection point, at least in the U.S., where it goes from being um, an opportunity, a, a clear giant opportunity, to uh, putting your money where your mouth is and, and executing. Um, you you have to perform. Uh, you have to run a real business. You 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 have to be operational. You have to hire. Um, at the end of the day, cannabis in the U.S. and, and not unlike Canada, it's it's commercial agriculture, it's product formulation, it's uh, packaging, it's logistics, it's distribution, it's HR, it's compliance, it's legal, it's all of the things that traditional business is, um, which also includes EBITDA and profitability. So I think you're going to start to see some separation um, because it, it is not easy. Uh, the challenges come from every angle. Uh, it's part of the opportunity in the U.S. space too. It's not easy. When you're talking about a state by state by state regulatory structure, that's a very difficult uh, environment to try and, and scale a business with a with a national footprint, but it's it's about execution this year. 100% agree. So, from my perspective as a chief advocacy officer and coming from the Canadian perspective, the two greatest challenges facing me right now are diversity and inclusion and social justice. So on the diversity and inclusion front, the movement in Canada used to be more diverse, have better gender balance, and when the regulatory reform came in place in Canada, there were huge barriers to access to create a legal company, and it's a very capital intensive space. And so we saw a shift in the culture of what the face of the movement was when we became an industry. More, a much bigger influx of people from the venture capital world, from corporate finance, from mining industries. And the face of the cannabis industry became very lacking in diversity. And that's something that I'm looking to address and working on inside my own company. And also hope will sort of set a standard and a shift around the industry in general. So then when I think about social justice and I think about the tremendous privilege that I have to be working in a legal regulated environment inside one of the world's largest publicly traded companies, we have a tremendous responsibility to address the social justice issues and the incredible harms that cannabis prohibition has done, both in Canada and both in the States. And that's a really complex thing to figure out how to contribute to in a meaningful way, learning from and being guided by the people who have had lived experience and not just rolling down into the States as a bunch of white people from Canada with a bunch of weed money that want to like show up and solve a problem. So those are two complex challenges that I am facing right now that I'm really excited to be working on. Before we get to Bradley, I just want to ask you, do you feel like there is momentum on those two fronts? Because they are pretty important, but it's not necessarily the kind of topic that would come up in a weed discussion you know, topic number two, uh, maybe a, a year well, ago. Well, you know what? The before. fact that you invited me to this stage to come and talk about this issue, not in a cannabis conference, but to people that are from very different industry, and you all seem to be interested in talking about this. I saw a lot of nodding heads and a few big smiles. I think that shows that there is um, progress and momentum. And in fact, I think it's just becoming table stakes around if you're going to be a successful cannabis company that people who we love lead are going to love your company. People care about these issues. Yeah, so I mean, as a VC, to me, the greatest challenge is finding companies that can survive kind of the lack of structure and the lack of kind of regulatory approval and, and stay in business until that's all resolved, right? So especially for a cannabis tech company, which I think is a little different than sort of like a vertically integrated ad company or something like that. Um, you know, if you don't believe that there's going to be a real liquidity in the VC marketplace for cannabis until it's taken off Schedule 1 by the U.S. government, because right now, like, I don't have any vice clauses in my fund, but most funds do. And if you have pension money, which we don't, but if you do, you certainly have vice clauses. It's really hard to invest in things like cannabis. And as a result, when a cannabis tech company is doing around, it is A, usually a lower valuation than it could be otherwise because there's fewer people bidding for it. B, the ability to use cash to scale and grow is very different than it is in like scooters, for example, where like we just buy scooters like crazy and don't really worry about the profitability. Um, and C, um, it, the question is really, if you don't have that, you're not raising that much money and you can't, um, if you can't scale and use money to 
can you stay in business until 2022 or whenever the Schedule 1 happens? Um, and I, so far, when we kind of do our analysis, you know, I really like to invest more in the space, um, you know, when we're looking for some high growth tech startups, and the answer is almost always no. Okay, we're at a tech conference, so I have to ask you about this. When we talk about a weed, a cannabis company, is it a tech play? And I know it depends on the kind of, of company, of course, but tell me about it, the tech it's free, So it's frequently not. I mean, a lot of stuff comes our way that is cannabis related, and I think I've publicly expressed interest in it, like sitting here, so people know to send me their decks, but that most of it's not. So we're in a company called Ease, which is a delivery uh, app for cannabis. That's definitely a tech startup as much as you know, Postmates or Uber Eats or anything else is a tech startup. Um, I think there's some around things like um, control, both for edibles or vapes or things like that. I think they have a real technology component to them, and I think also are pretty needed in the marketplace. But by and large, most of the stuff that we see, people are pitching themselves as cannabis tech. Um, it's a cannabis company, and it might be a great business. It's not really a tech, com te a tech company that's going to get like a 10x if you invest with the seed and it works out. Hillary, thoughts? Um, I mean, one thing that I think has been interesting to observe for us is that since legalization in October, the talent pool from the tech industry and from engineers has really increased now that we're a federally legal company and it's not just medical, and now we're able to attract talent from this sector that previously we couldn't, say, compete with Google or another big company, and now we're able to, and that's really interesting. When it comes to technology and cannabis, um, just from my personal experience, I'm a little bit of a contrarian. I think that the way the plant grows out of the ground is like pretty extraordinary and exquisite in all of the different cannabinoids and terpenes. And my favorite technology allows me to access whole plant cannabis or whole plant extracts, but in a like sexy, convenient way that like doesn't stink up my purse as I want to like ingest cannabis out in the world. And I mean, technology has been an essential aspect of being able to scale our business um, in terms of like all of the global work that we're doing, in terms of the production, in terms of figuring out how to be more sustainable around energy consumption, and even post-legalization, figuring out we have an e-commerce business, we have a bricks and mortar business, we're doing a lot of work business to business with provincial governments, and all of that is like the IT guys, I'm like, <laughs> I bribe them, like nothing happens, nothing advances unless the IT guys are like in your corner. So I just want to unpack a little of that a little bit because I, I don't think we were in that kind of scenario before where you had top tech talent saying, okay, who am I going to work for? Is it going to be Google or some tech multinational company or a cannabis company? That's right. fascinating to me. And what, what can a, a weed company offer that like a big old Google can offer? Well, can you guys take, I have a question for Hillary then, which am I allowed to ask a question too, which is you now have these giant tech companies under attack for sometimes some pretty bad practices, whether it's Facebook or Google or Amazon. Are you guys able to use that to attract talent and say, hey, your company's starting to be pretty evil. This is a really just cause because ultimately if you believe in the decriminalization of drugs, this, you should be wildly for this. Is, have you been able to get more talent because of that? You know, I don't know what HR's tactics are when they go out there <laughs> recruiting, but I think that um, some of the people, we were just chatting about how some of the people that we know that have developed some really amazing code talk about how they did it high and their creativity was connected with cannabis. So I think that maybe there's a correlation between brilliant engineers, brilliant creators in the tech world, and people who love weed, who want to be a part of the revolution. And although like 20 years ago, the revolution looked like taking weed with a backpack to sick people with a bicycle, and now it looks like a multi-billion dollar multinational company, this is still a revolution. And we're very much now just using the power of capitalism to tear down prohibition around the world. So I think that maybe is a part of hopefully what's attracting people to the company and to the yeah. industry. Yeah. Yeah, and when you're trying to attack that, attract that top tech talent, uh, is being able to offer them equity in a company that has a lot of room to grow, maybe more so than a Google, is that a factor? And also, do you guys offer beer and ping pong? <laughs> is, is that something that needs to we happen? We don't. I think there's a pool table. No beer, but we do have an inhalation room for people who need to medicate in the workplace. That's a thing. <laughs> 
Let's talk about the biggest opportunities for the industry. You know, from, from my perspective, uh, the biggest opportunities in the industry, uh, they really still stem from the, the industry itself, the, the growth, the, the runway that's still out in front of us. We refer to it as we, we might be in the, you know, the bottom of the first or the top of the second inning of a nine-inning baseball game. Um, this industry has yet to be defined. Uh, it is, it's one of the most incredible parts about the space is the opportunity to come in and influence it and help mold its direction. Um, just even to take a step back and, and understand tech's role and where this industry is going, when you're talking about a, a vertically integrated multi-state operator like us, tech plays a role in every, every single element of our business. We are using technology in one form or another to get better at it. So whether it's the environmental control systems and the monitoring and the data collection at the cultivation level um, through the really the distribution and that retail relationship that you establish with the customer base, this industry is getting uh, defined and built in a very, very modern era where social media is how you can build brands. And going even back to the social equity and social justice component, this is an industry that's being built in a way that can directly affect and better social justice and social equity issues because it's undefined. And it's a very rare bird, right, the, this industry that we're involved in. So um, if opportunities are limitless. we get it right limitless. at this point. I mean, if, if we and that's the, the role of, is yet to be charted, but it, it's the role of everybody that's involved in it, right? It's it's the it's the obligation that gets put on every one of us as investors, as operators, as advocates and operators to make sure that this does get built in the right way and we do things that put us down that path, which includes hiring practices and diversification of ownership and, and working with regulators to make sure that the administration and those those legislators get it get it right. Across the industry, do you think that there is that aware, level of awareness of all the potential pitfalls and, and just that understanding of here's what's at stake? I think it's a, it's a mixed bag. I think you'll find, you'll, <laughs> find, uh, you'll find some operators that are absolutely conscious of it. And again, that's, that's, the, that's the focus of, of them as an organization. I can tell you the mission of Cresco Labs has always been to normalize and professionalize cannabis. And that's a very, very broad statement on what it means to normalize and or professionalize. But that's been a, a focus of ours from the very beginning. And there's definitely some of us that are like that. And there's definitely some people who that, that hasn't been their focus. But I, I think you'll continue to see that develop. Opportunities? Yeah. So I think the greatest opportunities for me are around, I want to see the millions and millions and millions of patients around the world that need to access this medicine to be able to do it in a way where they're not criminalized. They can get it in their pharmacy, their physician knows something about it, and so the global expansion is really exciting to me. The other side is around all of the government relations work that everybody is doing to try to, particularly in the states, create good federal legislation. I want to see everybody get out of cages, you know, like particularly we have so many people in jail that are people of color in the states related to cannabis issues, and so for me it's about I want to free this plant from the chains that bind her. I want to free the people that are in cages, and I want patients and physicians around the world to have this as a frontline toolkit. And I think that the industry and the advocates that work in the industry or the advocates that are yelling at the industry about what we should be doing, that collectively, this is a paradigm shift and a really important revolution. Um, really good. <laughs> Well said. Um, as an investor, I think I, we see two opportunities that are interesting. One is um, one of the big objections that seems to be being raised politically to legalization on the recreational front is poor communities saying we're already overrun with liquor stores. We don't want to repeat that same pattern of mistakes with dispensaries. Um, I'm an investor in a company called Ease. Ease is Uber for weed. Uh, I would love to see, I'd be very happy to see a scenario say, okay, we'll solve the dispensary problem by not having any, and everything will be on demand, and everything will be delivery. Um, to me, you know, if there's any jurisdiction willing to give that a try, um, that, that's a huge opportunity for our investment. Um, the second, which is kind of related, which is psychosaliva, which is a nice way of saying mushrooms, I think. Um, Denver just voted to decriminalize it, the people of Denver, it's a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it is a, it's, I mean, if, if Charles said that we're in the bottom of the set first or top of the second, this is like the pregame show on Psychoslibin, but um, it's at least now worth looking at 
are there opportunities that you can invest in now that if, if it could somehow stay in business until full decriminalization and legalization could be really valuable. So it's, it's beyond super early, but it's something that we're just starting to look at. Do you want to riff on that, Hillary? One just addition around an opportunity is both from a market expansion and also just because it's awesome. We're doing a bunch of research around animal health. So how many of you are dog and cat people? Yeah. So like when my dog had cancer last year, I used a lot of CBD in his treatment and I was able to access researchers and clinicians and veterinarians that could help me figure out how to dose them. It's way harder to titrate an animal that can't tell you how they're feeling. But I'm super excited about cannabis medicines for horses and dogs and cats. Like I want that amazing relief of suffering that we get as patients to also be for all of our animal friends. Let's talk a little bit about that potential for disruption. We don't have a ton of time, but, and I know it is early stages, the potential to really take a big bite out of the business that uh, is, you know, big pharma, big beverage, um, big tobacco. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look, there's, there's all kinds of opportunities. We, we get pitch CBD brands all the time. And part of me says, like, investing in a beverage company is just not a great business. But then you, could you see how, like, a recess or someone could get bought at a wild valuation by PepsiCo? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, same thing on the farmer side, right? Um, so it's one of these things where the vast, vast, vast majority of the new startups in the space are going to go broke. Um, but one or two are going to have these incredible exits to Fortune 100 companies. Um, and those are going to be the ones that everyone remembers. So you know, finding those is what makes our job both fun and difficult. Um, but yeah, there's a ton of that happening right now. Happening? Going to happen? Uh, without question. Uh, happening already. Going to continue to happen. Um, and you're seeing it. Uh, you'd, you'd mentioned the talent that's available that come in the space now. Um, you know, some of our recent hires come from the highest levels of executive leadership at Big Beverage. And from their perspective, we, we started to see this materialize over the last two years, where maybe three years ago they were, they were sort of brushing this off as maybe, and it doesn't matter. And then two years ago it was, hey, maybe we should look at this. And then starting about last year, I, I think one of the companies invested $4 billion in, in one of the cannabis companies. So, uh, you know, our, our CMO we just hired was the president of the Miller Channel at, at, uh, at Molson Coors prior to doing this, and his perspective was, do I want to be fighting the disruption that's coming, or do I want to get on the side of being the disruptor? That's a lot more fun. So I think that, that, uh, that sort of sums it up. You feel like the tides are turning? Without question. Hillary? OK. Yeah, totally. Not a ton of time. Just uh, any myths that persist that you would love to just nip in the bud, since we've got a captive audience here. <laughs> got it. Um, how many of you are employers? Like, How many of you have the power to hire people? So if you want to be a part of restoring some of the social justice issues and the harms that cannabis prohibition have done, has done, when you're looking at diversity and inclusion in your hiring practices, hire people that have criminal records, particularly for cannabis offenses, but even I would say look at other non-violent drug offenses. Victims of the war on drugs need jobs to make sure that they don't end up poor, homeless, and then we get into recidivism. So each of us, whether you work in the cannabis industry or not, give people jobs that have criminal records and be a part of the solution. That feels like a great place to end it. Thank you very much for giving us your attention. Thank, Thank you. you to my panelists. If you want to continue the conversation, find us on social media. Bye.